Yeah. You let me know for showing up. Yep. Okay. I appreciate it. Mm. Okay, can you uh, tell me where my is? Love here. Oh. Is it because they're working on my lessons? <laughs> if it's not, then uh, uh, I regret it. I really would. But it's not going to bother you, I do. No students in my class. Here, if you get this recording, um, you can fast forward until you find some actual lesson. Oh, now we have a form. Where he has a work. I think it's not the bit, is it? Okay. There is here. Oh, yeah. I don't even recognize you. Uh, but Jeremy is not here. Joel is not here. Jeremy. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, uh, Jeremy is here, but Joel is not. And Zach, Zach is here. But Jesse's here. And then Daryl is here. Oh, that's what I'm here to do, is to make you scholar. He's a scholar in Greek. He's a scholar in Greek. I'm getting All right. I'm going to quickly go through some stuff we went through last time and then add some to it. Then you're going to tell me um, your thoughts on boxes. Uh, this article we went over as kind of a basic definition of it's the accepted teaching of the church or a church as the most essential. But I think that in the rest of our lives, we'll be dealing with what is the most essential. Um, now, you see this, I asked you last time, but if you had to draw two or three from that list, that's essential. And we'll talk about what that means in a minute, but just as you hear the question from a minute. You have to drop two or three from that list. What would you drop? The Trinity, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. You would keep them or drop them? I'll keep them. Oh, you keep them. I want to know what you would drop. Well, Let's say you have limited time, you're in a foreign country, you're studying with somebody that's going to lead a brand new church, and you can only cover a limited number. Which one would you leave? In times and hills. In times. In times and hills. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Um, I mean, if you're talking about. You don't have time to get to them. You don't have time to get to them. Hold it. Now, another way of asking you a question, and I want you to give your definition to somebody asking you, would be. Which of these are so important you could lose your soul if you didn't understand it? Mm -hmm. Is it important or you would drop it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so important that if you didn't understand it, yeah. well, Jesus, Jesus Christ was fine. I said, where's that? If you, um, yeah. if someone asks you, you get to understand this class, and somebody says, well, when you say is it an essential doctrine, what do you mean? What would you say? 
But if you're great at singing or do this on the screen or anything. Before. Jesus Christ, because if, you, if you're talking to somebody, well, what has you to sing? If you can do that, I don't like that. Okay. If you get nothing else, you got to get that. you got to get that. Is that what you mean by And that's why we disagree. If you're talking to somebody in the past, we disagree with your religion. It's usually about Jesus. Who, who do you, you can ask one question. Who do you say Jesus Christ is? And that's usually the he asked somebody that question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so who do you say? A more of uh, a specific focus. Uh, and Paul mentioned something about how, you know, if we don't believe that Jesus uh, was raised, then our whole, uh, everything is vain. And it's all that starts with Jesus. So that is right. the most essential thing we have for you. Jesus, yeah. the resurrected Jesus. Yeah, the resurrected Jesus. Yeah, the resurrected Jesus. I feel like it's, it's good to know Jesus, you know, the person, but what did Jesus come on this earth to do? You know, what message did he bring with him? And what did, what, what did he want to learn? I think that would be very essential because we need to know what Jesus came here to do and how if we're going to be up under the new covenant, we need to understand about that covenant. So I say the word, the word of God, we've got to know about the word because if we don't, I mean, it even causes our lives. I mean, that's the basis. Jesus came here that we might have life and have more abundantly. But he came with a message for us to grasp and to apply in our lives. So I say the word of God. So let me take two other angles on that, because I think it's an important subject. Mm -hmm. One is, you could argue, if people do not accept the Bible as God's word, why would they believe in Jesus? I mean, what are you going to give them other than God's word to tell them? But I remember the preacher when I was an undergraduate in Search City, Arkansas, saying he only once had really studied with a true atheist, uh, or only once had about anywhere. And rather than argue with him over cosmology and morality and things like that, he said, I just want you to read through the Gospel of John. Read through it with as open a mind as you can, and then we'll talk. Uh, what was the Gospel of John written? Do you think you have known? Or did you may know that Jesus Christ is the Son? Did you make that up? No, that's in the 23rd chapter. It's not them. So, in that sense, even if they don't believe it's the inspired Word of God, if we believe it, then we believe that the Word could, could bring the message to their heart. So, essential. Now, I'm purposely making it obscure. All right, we went over these creeds. Uh, I told you my history and background. I just I have an aversion to creeds, and I'm I'm that way about everything. I don't want somebody to tell me what to say. Every now and then, somebody will stand up in the church and hey, found some poem or some essay. He says, "I want you all to repeat after me," and I was like, "Can I see that first you now?" I just don't want somebody else to tell me. What I have to say, I believe. On the other hand, I think it's okay to demand that someone confess Christ when they when they when they convert him. I think it's okay to demand some kind of statement from someone who's becoming a U.S. citizen that they will support the Constitution of the United States. So there are things that can be said. The, the thing that becomes evident in these creeds is that they are focused. I think on the issue of the day, and there, it's very hard to get them broad enough. And that's why I was playing with the, with the question, are there non-essential doctrines in the Bible? But I want to follow that up. When Jesus scolded the Pharisees for tithing their spices, remember what he said about their neglect. What did they neglect? Yeah, mother, that's the one they neglected. That was the one they neglected. Mother, father, they were doing the coping, the coping. Right. But he said, "You'll tie your mint and cumin, but you have neglected." Anybody remember the phrase comes after that? Depending on your version, it says, "The weightier matters of the law." Yeah. I remember one of my graduate professors pointing out to us. He said, people who haven't been very uh, careful in forming their beliefs 
often has what he calls a flat earth view of the body. There are no peaks. There's no main point. Everything in it's equally, you know, what, what you believe about speaking in tongues, baptism, and the meaning of the image in Daniel. All are on the same level. He said, then why would Jesus say that you have neglected the weightier matters? And if it's true of the law, could it also be true of the gospel? That there are weightier matters. And if there are weightier matters, aren't there less weightier matters? It wasn't any thought to mention. Because I think I probably had tended towards the flat earth. You know, it's always for it's vital. So, yeah, that's what doctrine is about. Besides what really rises to the top if you ever really have to choose. All right, this was the one, and this is what uh, I think that the mid 1800s. Um, well, I thought I could use a highlighter, but I don't have that set up. It's the first part of this that in the mid 1800s people began seeing creeds as this harsh. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all, hold the true Christian faith. Now, I don't think that's talking about trust in Jesus. I think it's talking about a set of truths, doctrines, because that's what Paul. Whoever does not keep it whole and undefiled will without doubt perish for eternity. Does it be a little harsh to you? <laughs> it pretty much says if you don't get the whole thing right, you're going to hell. Though. And it says, I mean, it says keep it whole and undefiled. Now, if it said respect the whole world, study the whole world, honor the whole world, obey everything that you've understood, sure. But then it goes into this, um, to me, a little bit hard to follow explanation in the Trinity. That I think is only a statement for people who already believe it. I think that it would be hard to convince someone deciding to convert they had to believe. Uh, I mean, you might get equal in glory and co equal in majesty. That makes sense. And then, uh, sort of, what the Father is, that is the Son, and that is the Holy Spirit. Each is uncreated. The Father's unlimited, and so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. They're all eternal. But at the end of that next last, uh, sorry, the last paragraph, yet they are not free. That's where I think, um, if you're going to be reciting a creed, that was, I think, wait a minute. Any dollar chapel today just so happened when they were singing, just we'll talk with Jesus. And they got to, um, can you feel a little prayerful yearning? The words on the screen said, when you feel a little prayer, wheel turning. Uh, unless somebody tried to use voice to tech, uh, unless somebody was playing a joke. But I mean, that's something been around a long time. There's not many people who, who wonder what the words are today. Yeah. So, you know, it's saying, you know, if you're going to change a doctrine like that, then. then but I have to stop and think about it. What, are you trying to do something here? By the way, when I was at Harding, used to be college, university, uh, every year, the courses from all the church Christ schools get together and then they'll bring in some guest conductor and then they all and it was at Harding one year when I was there. And they brought in the guy who wrote just a little talk with you. His name is Cleavon Little and he watched Little. Mm -hmm. It was such a privilege to watch that little man, he's all about this guy, leading this huge course from several universities and he just a little talk with you with what you know anybody to say. But it was a group. Anyway, you see what I'm saying? It does stop. You're changing that? What are you a prayer wheel? I don't know any Christian group that believes in prayer wheels. So, I understand, but it, I would get that way when I got older. And yet they are not three. Alright, they're all eternal. This is always the same, same thing. They're all almighty. Which makes you wonder what the word almighty means. Alright, the same, same, same. Is it biblical to say that the Holy Spirit is Lord? 
I'm not being anti biblical, but can you draw that out? Can you tell me a scripture that says that? There are not three lords, but one lord. But so there weren't three. So this is consistent. We recognize each person by himself to be God and Lord. We are forbidden by the Christian religion to say that there are three gods or three lords. I can't argue with that. The Christian religion says there's only one God. Amen. If Dan's trying to explain something that's difficult. Yeah. What's the word they use with, uh, maybe it's not the right word, with the name of the ineffable name. But it's, it's something I'm not sure we were meant to be able to fully express. Uh, they're not created. Uh, the sun was not created, but was begotten by the body. What does that mean? <laughs> if, if you were an unbeliever, don't you think they were playing the court? I didn't exactly cheat. I had help, but I didn't cheat. I we all keep that way about God. Okay, but the Holy Spirit was neither created or begotten. No, this is end. I can pull this out of scripture. But I think going back to that council and prayer. We're talking like in the three hundreds. Yeah, first church council. Where we just got it said that and God God made Jesus and then Jesus made the world and then the other one kind of said that. My guess is that in the early days, they, they harkened back to the Jewish background of the church. Because uh, you know what the Shema is? The Jew says every day, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you should love the Lord with all your heart and father, children, and father, and all. So they said every day, the Lord is one. Jesus said that was the most important passage. Not that he stressed the one, so that's in passage. So, yes, I understand the one yet, but it looks like they were trying to prove that they were consistent with what had always been taught about the oneness of God, and yet introduced these new ideas. One son, not three sons. All right. So, we went on the top of your head last week on what, your doc what doctrines we make here. List. If we have time today, we may go pull some songbooks in and start looking for it. Can you think of well known hymns that are really doctrinal saints? Jesus keeps the cross. Because that's where I can, that precious fountain, I can, I can find the true blood of Jesus. There's peace. There. It's a fairly modern fair, modern, compared to some hymns. But you know some are God, he is alive? Mm -hmm. That's clearly a doctrinal statement. Nathan Griffin. A strong, strong doctrinal statement. Uh, today, I found it interesting, they said, um, just as I am. Which, you know, because of Billy Graham, we only think it would come forward softly. <laughs> <laughs> it's really a beautiful thing. <laughs> But it's very doctrinal, isn't it? That, uh, you know, I don't have any grounds to say that you should accept me. It's only in Jesus that I have him told. So very much our hymns are statements of doctrine. Hey, God, they have this about holding the over. The hymns could be changed. It does. And I, I meant to bring... Actually, they were asking us what we were going to do on our Tuesday chapters. I said I would do the training because we did that on Sunday to talk about the doctrine has done it, so I have some of my this. But uh, there are two versions. I grew up singing the version in the blue book. And I thought I remember to bring you the blue book someday. <laughs> and it said, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, God over all and blessed eternal. What's the Trinitarian version of the same? God in three persons. And I mean, I didn't start with the church. I was I mean, that version been around a long, long time. I think it had to do the reason that the congregation I was in kind of linked with that, that kind of choosing of songs. It had to do with a, a strong statement. Let's call Bible things by Bible man. You can do Bible things in Bible words. 
you don't even find the word Trinity. And if you find the word Godhead, that's a weak translation. And we're going to talk in a few minutes about textual variance, and if you go to the one passage that says there are three that bear witness the Father and the Spirit and the Son, that is one of the weakest attested passages of Scripture in the whole Bible. So, the Trinity might be a good understanding of God and Jesus and the Spirit. But the term itself, I don't think we need to hammer too hard. So Jesus and that's how it is. All three of them are present there, right? God and Father and mm-hmm. Spirit. God the Son is being baptized, and then God the Holy Spirit comes down and comes down. And of course, in Matthew's account of the Great Commission, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. However, you know, there are traditions in which uh, they baptize in the name of Jesus only. Oh, yeah. Because later in Acts, you only read they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Which tells me that what the baptizer Said, really doesn't determine what I'm saying or not. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't think that's it. Right? Well, I said it wrong. They're not. They're not saying. Although I think it's important to. This is a solemn occasion and, and a happy occasion, but but you need to pronounce what it's all about. And hopefully, have talked with that person beforehand about what it means that it's in the name of the Father and the Spirit. So that's there, but. I still want you to, if somebody asks you in Sunday school now, on this next Sunday, are there any non-essential doctrines in there? How would you answer? Well, I don't know what church you're in. If you're in the Church of Christ, you would honor that baptism. It's essential. It's essential. If you were in probably another church. How about if you're in a church that requires only males? They would bring up. They would bring up, they would, they, their argument would be the, you know, the argument would be the people on the cross. And Jesus didn't ask him anything about that. He said, today you'll be with me in eternity. I think today most, most people I know in churches of Christ agree that Jesus can take anybody anywhere they want to. But that if we want to tell people what the Bible, how the Bible is right, baptism, they'll we'll connect to the salvation. Yeah. All right. And then they will argue the issue, you know, you go. Why don't you say, and that, 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 that's, that's uh, a point of disagreement within our culture, sure. uh, whether it's essential and, or whether it's a preference yeah. or an individual choice. Yeah. Yeah. It did, however, create a division because it's something that if a congregation had half of that one line, half of the other, it's not something you can do together. Yeah. So that that did create some division. Yeah. In the old school, would be would be going to leave it like it was. Mm-hmm. But, it, but these new folks have been instrumental and get in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. What I would respond is that there are either more essential doctrines, there are weightier matters would be a much better term. And perhaps some of the doctrines yeah. that people are questioning are simply human interpretation and not, are actually in the Bible. They may or may not be right. But you have to do you know, a bunch of band aids to put it together to come up with that document. You know, the good example I think is Acts. It's the second chapter of Acts when the church began. Peter just stood there and he preached about Jesus Christ. And, and then the Bible said there was a. We now be my And he, and he convinced he just, them. He just preached the way to And going back to your word, mm-hmm. he preached what was important. The way to go. All right. I think we'll work on this together for a minute. If it works. There's some internet lists I'll make this available to you on Blackboard. You ever heard of Elmer Towns? Uh, he was a church growth writer. He's now president of Liberty University. And I think that he, if this will please him up. Yes. No. There he is. Um, he wrote this some time ago, and he has, uh, I think, two parts of this article. Here's a summary of what he says is the main eight major doctrines. You're going to have an assignment after you go home and go back, and I want you to make two columns. He made my list, maybe not essential. 
So we're going to go through them together and get other people's side. Alright? You and he seem to be on the same page. The Bible. And he says the doctrine that is essential is that you believe that the Holy Spirit guided human authors so that they wrote in Scripture what they wrote in Scripture. It's accurate and without error. The real value of the Bible is realized in our life as we apply it. But he says the first thing is you have to believe that we have an errorless Bible. That needs to be definition. Uh, I like better the, the way you say that the Bible is correct in all that it teaches, rather than my copy is correct. All right, God. I think it is the best book which we discuss first. But our view of God will impact the way we live. He's a spirit, a person. He is life. He is self-existent, unchanging, unlimited by time and space, and a unity consistently works out his eternal plan by guiding and overseeing everything by his wise and holy purpose. That's a powerful. But there's nothing in there that I consider non-essential to understanding God. How's it going? Why do I have much to do that? You collaborate. Yeah. Right now what? You want to just do it and not watch you? Yeah. You know what? I think I clicked that before I started recording. Maybe that's a problem. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, I have to go choose it, maybe? Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Okay. Come back and let me know if you're done. I will. Thank you. Right. There. That was Will. He's helping us get on target with this. Uh, let me know if you need to find out where some of the things are that were displayed in you didn't know. All right. Christ. Jesus is God incarnate in human form that prevents it. He is the second person in the Trinity. Okay, but I don't think that's necessary to worry about, right? Who came to live among us, die for us, and resurrect that someday we might be able to live with him forever. Except for, you know, ordering the members of the Trinity. I think that's that's sort of essential doctrine. Oh, wait a minute. Simba was going to drop the Holy Spirit out of the central box. At least lower on the list. Lower This guy puts it uh, third. Uh, fourth. Not just a force. All the attributes of personality. Is God, third person of the Trinity. And his work brings us to Christ and salvation. He keeps us for ministry. Empowers us for service. And produces spiritual fruit in our lives. It's interesting to me, as I was working on church history for my general non-majors class on Christian cultural heritage, if you look at the mid-1800s, particularly in America, religion had a lot of new terms, including Mormonism, uh, what we call the Stone Campbell Restoration Movement, the Churches of Christ Movement, too. But a little bit later, also, charismatic Pentecostalism. Oh, yeah. And all are viewed as restorationists. Uh, you might want to borrow the library's copy. I don't know if you can borrow it. But read the library's co copy of the Stone Campbell Encyclopedia or the Encyclopedia of Stone Campbell Movement. It has a, a really good article on restorationism. It points out there's more than one idea of what restorationism is. Although they came to completely different places, the Pentecostal charismatic reaction to Protestantism hadn't quite turned this thing around yet, was that the one-to-one -one relationship with God has been left out. We need to restore that direct experience of God. And eventually it came to be interpreted as 
And that's even more important than whether you have uh, parsed your verbs in Greek correctly. The Mormons, with that opinion, said, yes, indeed, Joseph Smith had one of those revelations. Boy, was it different than what we knew before. But then they go on to say, as one of my students last year told me, that the Mormon uh, elders told him that if he could read the Book of Mormon, that's God telling him if it's true or not, he would. And God did, and it was true. But can you see that they were both trying to restore this when God talked to people or God moved directly on them. And then in our tradition, it was, let's restore the simplicity of the original church. Let's not teach anything that's not clear in the Bible. So all of these movements were going in different ways, and on the Holy Spirit, um, until I would say the 1960s or so, among churches of Christ, and probably among many traditional uh, denominational groups, the Holy Spirit was just kind of there. And then, charismatic Pentecostal churches were just mushrooming, and, and sometimes that would spill over into the more traditional uh, congregations. And so people started dealing with it more. And I think I've learned a lot since the 60s. I don't pretend to be an expert. But there are different interpretations of what it means to say that the Holy Spirit brings us to Christ and salvation. I think it is biblical to pray that God would open someone's heart. Sure. You know, he did too, literally, right? On the other hand, how he does it and what the Spirit does. Uh, I know not how the Spirit moves convincing men of sin. I think I'll have to try to say that, that's a good sentence. But, I have a suspicion that people who think the bolt of lightning hit them and God turned them around may be more emotionally true. Now, I'm not the eternal judge on that. But I would question it if it was my child or my brother. But even, but however he did it, would you still, you would still give him the credit? Even, even if it, if it, you know, if I came to church and you preached, mm -hmm. and then on my way at the door, I was talking to her, and she said something to me, you know, she spoke something to me that maybe she knew from the, from the sermon, and, and she said something to me, and we were standing with her talking, and I said, Wow. Yeah, I you think, know, that's why I'm saying. It's still the Holy Spirit. I would think, I would, I would think the Holy Spirit was speaking to her again. That's why I've come to lie to you all the time. I know not how the Spirit was speaking yeah. to I used to think when I was very young, yes, I do. He does it through the Bible. But I find that it's not that simple. Now, that does bring up the question, is the Spirit convicting and converting people without the words of the Bible. I think that word only goes too far. And I think that spirit apart from the word goes too far. Don't you? So, these are some broad statements that would need clarification and you have complete agreement on. But, that they are elements of basic Christianity is biblical. Peace. Unique being. Uh, they are unique from animals from creation, created in the image and likeness of God. Let me just stop a minute and say that for God. But what does it mean? I don't think it has anything to do with whether you're tall or dark or handsome. I don't think it has anything to do with whether you're male or female, communist or capitalist. We're made in the image of God in that we are spirits that can live forever, who have a moral sense, and who have responsibilities, who live in relationship with one another and with God. <coughs> so, made in the image and likeness of God, I would say biblical anthropology then would be an important doctrine to understanding the nature of people. Uh, they have both a 
physical and a meta meaning more than physical aspect, body and soul or spirit. And by the way, it says the word of God can separate between soul and spirit. If y'all can sort that out, send it to me. Because, now listen to this one, because of our ancestral parents' failure, that should be plural, to obey God, sin was introduced into the human experience. I'll swallow that completely. Causing the need for reconciliation to God, our Creator. I like the way that he avoided pinpointing something we may not all agree on, which is uh, total depravity and born in sin. I think what he said is true. When sin came into the world, it became a part of the human experience. I hesitate to say human nature because it's a loaded term. That we inclined to sin. Yeah. Ever since Pandora's box was open. And that the world and tradition and the way we live is so powerful that you need God's intervention to change it. Now, I think that uh, Calvinistic total depravity is is a hard um, position to fully defend. Salvation. The most significant experience in life is that involved in receiving salvation provided by Christ on the cross, conversion, regeneration, justification, sanctification, and eternal life. To just say that all those are incorporated in what salvation is, I, I think it's a good statement. I don't know if it's just a tradition, but speaking of being saved means something to all who call Christ. But to the outsider, maybe we need to realize it's not the only metaphor for the change that happens. And that's where he brings in these other ideas. There are other biblical expressions of the change of relationship that we have when, when what we commonly say when we're saved. The church. Well, now we've got a difference. Jesus instituted the church. It means the Christians assembling together. I like that because that is what church means. It means assembly. To encourage, help one another. More effective in reaching out. Uh, the called out ones. Uh, who come together for worship, instruction, fellowship, and evangelism. I think it's a mistake. Uh, to try to sandwich together the idea of being called out as being God's chosen people with the idea of the church being called out to me. One is just etymology, the other is a big doctrine, and, and they're not they're, they're not easy. When we talk about etymology, you know that uh, you run into James, if anybody comes into your synagogue, God's way. And we have Paul being told not to go to the Ecclesia was in an Ephesus because there's going to be a riot, which just means the assembly. So there were words that were used in, in special ways. Uh oh, we throw the whole thing apart. That, come, that came to have a more specific meaning as Christian Jews. So what do you mean by church? I think he's, he, he's okay on this. And I think that most, well, survey show that the fastest growing religious group in America is the nuns, is an O, the nothing. People don't want to identify with a certain church. Yeah. Well, I think that the, that's a compound. And I think you do have to be in a congregation, and there have to be people of like precious faith. Well, I do think the non-denomination of churches, you say like the house, mm -hmm. that guy's preaching, he's preaching every Sunday to 4,000 people. Right. And that non-denomination means different things to different people. But I know exactly what you're talking about, and they are a fast growing group. Yeah. And there is a need in society not to be lined up with denominations. Well, he's teaching doctrine. I mean, he's teaching the Bible. He's teaching the truth. Now, this is what we're making into the other columns of is eschatology. That is, details of eschatology, anyway. Last thing, you knew that. Personal eschatology, God's final judgment, heaven and hell. Prophetic eschatology, the second coming of Christ. I think I would take the second coming of Christ in the way that it's usually interpreted, when it's going to be, what the signs of the times are. I'd take that off my sentence. 
and I'm there because Jesus said, I'll not bring it. And on what difference does it matter if I get hit by a bus on the way home and die, or if Jesus comes in my account of faith? So if you're talking about eschatology, I'm trying to teach my non bible majors Christian cultural heritage class that if your worldview doesn't include heaven and hell, that's a whole different level of looking at life. So if eschatology means after this life, there's an eternity with or without God, yeah, that's essential. But if it's details of the rapture and the, and the millennium and all that, I don't think that's the same. Yeah, I was walking with y'all in the and that's all we want to talk about the end time. I thought I didn't care. I was with Christ. Right, right. I think it does honor those that Jesus is coming back. Yeah, well, yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Then he's coming back. Yeah. He himself is coming back. I think this is my projection. I think it was Geisler or Geisler that had two parts that were put in that. He wrote one of the books that's supposed to use in Christian cultural heritage about your worldview. How much time have we got left? Oh, we got time. Good. Do you know what you're supposed to do with this that's going to be graded? You've got to be narrowing down what you think is an important enough doctrine that you can write a paper on. We'll, we'll talk about that because I've got a slide coming up. All right, the, sense, the essential doctrines of the Christian faith. I think you should write a paper like that and we should publish it and it should be required for your graduation that, <laughs> that uh, the entire faculty, not just the Bible faculty, say that you got it right. In which case, I say, save your money. <laughs> All right. He starts out talking about the creed and the history of the central doctrine. But here he does have a list. And I want you to go back and read this list when you're picking and choosing what makes the top of your list. All right? The creeds that he's familiar with, I thought I could point to it. There it goes. Number one is human depravity. I did not interesting. There's not a hyperlink on that one. That's the hyperlink code of Bible passage of the time on it. Christ, virgin birth. Did you know that Islam teaches the virgin birth? Not exactly like we do, but uh, and boy, you try to pin down what the Mormon teaching is on the on the virgin birth. And it's not, it's not but I do believe that the uniqueness of Jesus coming into the world for Mary. That's a pretty essential doctrine. His sinlessness. That makes all of the difference in moral religion to men. His deity. Well, I think you'd have a lot of trouble denying the deity of Jesus in reading the book of John. I'm talking about Muslims. Oh, yes. Yeah. They think that the disciples exaggerated the, the teachings of Jesus and they deified them. Have you ever seen a picture of the top of the U.S. Capitol from the inside? It's the apotheosis of Washington. And it shows George Washington ascending into the clouds with mythical gods around him. If you, I, I have a picture I show in my other class of a Buddha in a round structure surrounded by columns and a round dome on the top. And then I show them a picture of the Jefferson Memorial. Which one is an idol? And my favorite site in all of Washington, D.C. is the Lincoln Memorial. But can you see how someone would say that we are elevating him above human Nothing. He says his wife was crazy. He said, well, he wasn't that good. <laughs> so, the deity of Christ, yes, it's important. But what we mean by it, 
I think we can teach them. But I do not believe you can deal with. Well, I think you want to quibble about very much. In the beginning was the word, and the word was the heart of God. If that was the whole treatment of the subject, maybe there's some room for quibble. That whole chapter, that's the point. And he said it's the point of his whole book. So you, you can't believe in Christianity and not believe in his deity. And then he's in humanity. This is another one, and I don't see so much as I do with Trinity, people trying to pin this down. Trying to say, how could he be fully human and fully divine? Well, we know one thing, since he laid aside his divinity, he emptied himself, became human. That's enough for me to understand it could happen. I think we may also shortchange it when we say, well, my wife and I are one when it comes to our goals and ambitions and care for our children. I think it's much more than that. I think that's what a non-believer would say. That John was just saying, Jesus was so close to God, you, you just think of him as one person. But I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Uh, now, if he's you see him, you see him. Then God's unity and his triunity. Why he put those separately, I'm not quite sure. And you've heard me say I don't like the word triunity. I would love to find a better word that says God's multiple ways of reaching out to us through his spirit, through his son, through his word, the different aspects of God. I believe it's all about God. But triune, I think it's just a churchy term myself. The necessity of his grace, yes. Of faith, I don't know why I maybe thought that's so clear that we don't want to come out. His atoning death. I don't think many people really understand atonement, and I think they should go read a bit of this. Honestly. His bodily resurrection. Let me simulate your thought a little bit. Um, some of you have got to talk something, haven't you? I remember him saying in the hallway several years ago, he thinks the body of Christ is in heaven. Have you ever thought about that? If not, where is it? He didn't allow his holy one to see corruption. No. I don't think Dr. Parker thinks I was going to ask him about that when he gets to heaven. And I don't think that he wants to exclude anybody who, who doesn't think that's so. But it's a thought. Do you really believe in the bodily resurrection? Do you believe that they saw the body of Christ before he did the heaven? So what about the, you know, what about the tomb when the woman got ready when I was married and Mary Magdalene went to touch him and he said, I haven't seen him what I think he's saying, because I thought what you're saying, but I think it makes more sense. He's saying, don't hold on to me like I'm going away. I haven't left yet. I think that's what he's saying. And then again, uh, there's a question that he just suddenly appears in the room and nobody knows who he is. But that's different too. But you have to believe that his body was right. It says so, so plain. Uh, both that it was raised and that it ascended, that he serves as high priest. Now that is something that I don't think you can get fully out of the gospel. You probably don't get it when you read Hebrews. I mean, it, it's sprinkled in other places in the New Testament. But that, again, you won't understand that if you don't go back and read Leviticus and Numbers and, and Deuteronomy. A little bit of Exodus. Uh, particularly because we're all priests before God. And we don't have the same concept of priesthood. His second coming, final judgment in rain, which implies heaven and hell that shows up later. I'm okay with a lot of this list. But I want you to kind of go through it and see what you can come up with. I want to check this. I haven't had time. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. A lot of times saying it was very popular with, I believe, Alexander Campbell, who's from the tradition I come from, or who started uh, the tradition that led to churches of Christ, and some other people. But he didn't originate it. 
as beautiful as it is, I don't think it's terribly helpful, except for last time. Because I don't know how you would apply it. Non-essentials. Liberty. Well, which ones are? Well, the ones you and I disagree on. Those are the non-essentials, right? But that, you, can't, you can't maintain that in every situation. So it's a challenge. It's really a challenge. Now, part two, I'm not going to look at because he, uh, because um, those are the things he lists that he goes into tomorrow. And I think you probably should look at them before you decide what you're, you're going to put on your list. This is a short one. And I don't know who this is that wrote this. People are created in God's name. God created a person, Adam, from the dust of the earth. Brought him to life, created a person, Eve, from Adam's rib. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And what he's saying is, he takes that literally. I'm not saying I don't, but that's what he's saying. The Bible, again, it's near the top of the list. Okay? It is the inerrant word of God. Somewhere I have something called the Chicago Statement of Inerrance, and it was made in maybe the 70s, something like that. I'm going to a Bob Lee, we can get a how we want to say it. And I want to share that with you maybe next time. I'm sure that other people have come up with other statements since then. But what it says is that the Bible is accurate in all that it teaches, which is different from saying we have the and it can be a system of verbal of Christ, the very words of Christ. But you know, it's debatable whether he spoke to on the doctor really to set it in the book All right. I think this is probably the safest, oops, safest way to go. I don't have time to explain what you have to believe about God. I don't think all agree, you know, <laughs> but it needs to be tough for this. Now, believing who Jesus is, I think it's a little trite these days, the uh, lunatic liar savior. But yeah, I think people have to make a choice. And uh, God is up there with Jesus, I mean the Holy Spirit up there with God and Jesus in his divinity. He promised the Holy Spirit to be given to all believers. And I think we can just ignore it. It's part of Christian uh, theology. All right? And then that we are sinners. Now it says, because of one man, Adam, sin came into the world. I think you can find that to an extent in the Bible, and they all, Duffy Reader and Adam sin, Adam's fall, we sinned all. That's a little um, more interpretive. And I'm not sure that's straight out of the Bible. But all the sin and fall short of the glory of God, I'm having trouble understanding that. For a second. And the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. Now that is not, no longer a popular opinion. In the Bible Belt, you won't find many people aren't But, um, that's true. It is true. Yes. That's what the Bible teaches, and I believe it. But, um, by the way, one thing I put in the other class, the Barna survey a few years ago, 43% of Americans agreed that the Bible is 100% accurate and all that teaches. 48% believe that the Bible is the Word of God. So the culture, because I know my, I know my friend lives in California, he came on and, and he and I got into the discussion of the African and he's a music world. He's meeting out and he's a people going to do Well, you know, there are good people in these other groups. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was my point, that was exactly my argument. Yeah. Probably really good people. Mm -hmm. but, but you know, you can't change the truth. That's right. And we probably would like yeah. them. And admire them even. Right, these, these two I'm going to just introduce to you. These are two books from Google Books. And let's try and investigate how you can get a lot of good stuff out of Google Books. Right, the whole book isn't going to be there. But a lot of a real textbook like book on classical Christian doctrine is right there. And then, although it's not going to be all there, you just scroll down to the table of contents. And look, you've got 15 basic Christian doctrines the way he presents them. 
Now, if you come over here, um, scripture, the word was God. So what does that mean? It doesn't look like he's talking about Jesus as much as I wish he would. Uh, but then he is here. If you see me, you've seen the Father. Uh, and look what he puts on three. The thousand year reign. That is a short passage to make your main passage. Mm -hmm. I think I have one more Google book for me. Uh, John MacArthur, you probably know his name. Did you know he has a church down here, Josh McDonald's is going to speak there? He's my bankers. This is from Crossway. I like Crossway. They're the ones who put out the ESD. A lot of this stuff I like. And they have a little book called uh, Systematic Summary of Bible Doctrine. Again, you come down to the con to the uh, to the table of contents, and here are the ology words I've been looking for. Bibliology, I'll come back to that word in a minute. Theology proper, and I do use that term, I mean so it's about the Bible. Christology, pneumatology, anthropology, I think these are two separate subjects, I understand the connection. Harmatology, sin. Soteriology, salvation. And I don't know that I would put angiology up next, but he did. Ecclesiology. I do think it needs to be in there. But I don't think many of us have very clearly formed ecclesiology. We just go with what we're familiar with. And then eschatology. Now, I've consulted basically evangelical leaning sources. And it's interesting to me that uh, eschatology and the millennium and all comes up as much as it does. I consider myself an amillennialist. Meaning, I'm not going to guess what it talking about a specific time or a time to come. I get the point whether I know that or not. But it seems to be central, and to the extent that it's talking about heaven and hell is related to your life here on earth, I'm all about that. That's what we're going to talk about next technology. So, the assignment will be written out for you in uh, Blackboard. Uh, you go through that and come up with a selected list. Let's say you've been invited to France where there's been a revival of interest in, in Christianity and you're supposed to give four lectures on the most important doctrine, the radius matters in the gospel. Now, the number's not important, but I want you to deal with that, that struggle of are there weightier matters. Now, I want to jump back to exegesis and I will pass your body Next month, to give you some very specific information on what I'm expecting from you. I pulled up just by going, uh, first of all, I didn't spend enough time on exegesis. It is Bible study that focuses sharply on pulling out the original meaning. Exegesis. Pull it out of what it, before you apply it, what did it originally mean? You know the made up word eisegesis? What does that mean? X means put out, ice means put in. I believe that uh, polygamy is, is pleasing to God. So what do I do? I go in and I read about polygamists. I didn't necessarily say it was good. As a matter of fact, the examples we have didn't work out so good. But that's eisegesis. And, you, and I find it very hard to defend if you exegete the New Testament. So the point is that you are pulling it out. What did it say in the first place? Not what do I want it to say? Not what does it, how does it relate to today? But first, what does it say? Now, I pulled up to, just by Google, two things that claim to be exegetic. Neither one of them is meant to be a model. I didn't read really every word off them. Just to show you what we're talking about. This one is short, this one is too short, but you're turning into many. I don't know who this man is, and his uh, webpage is named after himself, so I'm not going to take anything with a grain of salt. 
Well, evidently this is a faith written right now. I don't know who to. And he's doing 1 Timothy 3, 14 through 6. Alright? He starts off saying kind of what the passage is about. Gets a little more specific. Notice here, he does something that I discourage in papers, and that's what several lines of quoting a Bible verse. Anybody who cares about something called an exegesis has a Bible. Better to put in, you know, words that stand out, or paraphrase it, and do a little bit more analysis. All right? He'd written it, intending to make a visit to see Timothy and speak to him, and the church of Ephesus as soon as possible. You can pull that out of scripture. I would have put some Bible references in there. Right out of it. Which thing? Alright. These instructions. So, he's saying, what does that mean? Is he telling them how to structure the church? Well, that is a big part of it. But is there a broader topic in there about... Um, fighting false doctrine. Is this a subpoint of that? And then there he talks about the um, he wants to hurry and see him. And he points out that uh, it's that uh, there is no hurry. It looks like there is no hurry for the day of judgment. So he relates to it, but I'm not sure that cleared up a lot about this thing. All right. Why was he delayed? He said it's about how to behave. Um, notice he throws in some more Greek here. Um, what you have to do with where you read from other people's commentaries and analyses, does it matter? If I don't know how many times again they've asked Dr. Parker or, or Dr. Bailey about a Hebrew or a Greek word and like, man, man. <laughs> there's no special meaning there. So sometimes the fact that a word derives from something is irrelevant to the point and doesn't help anybody understand the passage. So be careful when you do word studies. Now I think this is very significant. God's household. Significant meaning. And again, maybe or teo, teo is helpful, but to me it just means you know the words. Unless you want to talk about oiko, I said oiko, oiko being uh, an interactive unit. But you need to expand that. And then he says, you know, here's another verse, here's another verse. Again, mention them only if it expands the understanding of the passage. Just to say that he said this to Colossians and he said it to the Ephesians. Not particularly helpful except to say this must have been a very common and important doctrine. But you have to have a reason to bring it in. And then he has another phrase, which is the church of the living God. Well now I think that is significant. That's something you could really develop. And develop is that uh, the importance of the passage. Uh, church of the living. And then down here he talks about what it's supposed to do, it's supposed to hold keep it safe, it's to be the pillar of truth. Well, he's beginning, he's beginning to see, uh, and I don't, I'm not asking you to write things in the replay. It doesn't help you working with Microsoft Word and, and foreign characters, especially the rough breathing. I did get a rough breathing on something I put out for y'all, but it was, it was hard. All right, so then down here, he is showing you that this is verse like. We talk about that when we talk about creedal forms in scripture. So you may think that's not that long. I mean, that is long. By the way, that horrible, terrible, hundred page plus hundred page appendix plus seven hundred page back up. They've written and said, it was free, but well organized. And I don't want something great to read. I have to sleep. Mm -hmm. If you need to sleep, at least it's good to go. All right. So go back and look at that more. Just as an example, 
And if you don't really want to, uh, you don't want to copy it, but just to see kind of what it's like. Then there was a longer one, and I saved a copy, and I can't, I haven't found the original website. I have no idea who this is or what school he was at. But here's a full, fuller exegesis to give you an idea of what they look like. This is a PDF copy. Oh no. I got so many logins. I'm not going to spend five minutes on this. If it doesn't work, I'm going to go on until you can do what I'm drawing. Just as long as you cover everything. And only the things that are interesting. <laughs> You realize I'm showing you. Not that any of you would do this. Yours looks a lot like this. There's a word against the P and then zero. Oh, then you can't read this. <laughs> I have no idea what the Phoenix Seminary is. Okay, see? Talks about the context. He gives footnotes. This is who said things that you need to fly there and think it's true. He does use some Greek. You're not required to. Only if you think it makes a difference in, in what you're learning. He has footnotes again. Uh, he comes up with um, what, you know, where you would find other references because time and me is kind of an obscure reference. He fills that in again. He's down here and he's got where he got references. Um, you only use this long of quote if it is really impactful to what you're saying. And I can see how this would be. I think he's talking to people in Ephesus and um, we know about uh, Luke and, and the silversmith Demetrius. So that does give us an insight into, into this particular epistle. And Artemis of the Ephesians. And then he gives you some background history. Why that was such a big deal. However, notice that uh, there's something here about priestesses and the female adherents. Can you see how that might begin to relate to the role of women, which is kind of a, a, a tricky, tricky passage here. Yeah. And it might matter more in Ephesus than it did in Corinth, where women were a different kind of woman. The role of women was a different kind of woman. All right. Then he talks about the genre. Uh, second Timothy is more of a personal letter than First Timothy. First Timothy is more about church, and second is more about personal relationship as, as Paul is about to die. See, look, he's looked at a modern reference to it. In case you're getting this fun, but I'm not looking for this much. But a shorter version of this kind, the textual variants, we're going to take a few minutes to show you what you can do about that. Um, let's see. Whether Kai, the word and, belongs in there is questionable. Okay. And here are the ones that leave it out. Does it cre create continuity? Oh, by the way, when you're typing, you got First Timothy like that. Find a way to get the non-breaking space. 
it's hard to find on um, his word and all. But you want to keep one and two together. It just kind of looks dumb that way. And see, so he's telling which version he got that out of. He does bring up, listen to this. This makes you think this may have missed it. I did find something interesting while looking at the Codex Analyticus. Because that's one you, yeah, that's one you can look at live and actually see it. Uh, he misspelled Didaskin. And Didaskin. Doesn't really matter. I thought it was cool because I found it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right, then he gets his translation. I'm not going to sit you make a translation, just that you indicate where, you know, actually I would lean more toward, towards what the NASB says here because if it's significant to your passage. Yeah. All right. Then he gets to really tough things here about um, going in and lifting up holy hands. But look, my church, Trinity Mennonite Church, we all have been using NRSB. All right, well, he's, he has revealed something about himself, but that sometimes is important to your reason, to know you're coming from a Mennonite background. We think about that as very old traditional. I'd have to check to see what that uh, midnight attitude was about women leaving the church. Uh, Litherington, that's obviously a well recognized writer. All around goes. Syntactical ambiguities. I would suggest if you don't work, use the word syntax every day, skin through it and see what in the world syntax is. Uh, he makes reference to. Um, important uh, dictionaries of the original language. And then I uh, suggest so already that uh, I'm not permitted to to speak. So and he goes on down. And you see it's 31 pages. I don't expect you to read it. I do not want 10 and 31 page papers to grade. But, but I want you to look for elements in this that should be incorporated in your Okay. So, Richard gave that because of someone that's written like an engine in his first book. Now, I don't want you to too quickly say there's nothing here that matters on the variant in the text. We're talking about where there's an ancient version that says one thing and another one says a different thing. So let's introduce that a little bit. First of all, Bruce Terry, who I believe teaches at one of our sister schools, has put on his website a list of the significant textual variants in first century. So I would suggest that you go through and look at those. And then if you want to throw a note in that says I found this on Blue Series website. But what he's doing is he is drawing, I don't expect, I don't know all of this. But I thank the one who has strengthened me, Christ. So you see him doing it in English. I thank the one who strengthened, strengthened the past tense, strengthens perfect. So he's saying, is that significant? Some copyists apparently borrowed the present tense from Philippians 4.13. So in looking at it, you need to decide if that relates to the point you're drawing out of the passage. If it does, then you might mention whether or not Paul is writing about Christ presently giving him strength or in the past relates to the thing that he's with you now. I'm just, saying, I'm just making that up. All right. Then the saying is faithful. Okay. The saying is human. Those are not the same. And he gives you some explanations how that could be different. Uh, who and which to this end we labor and strive, we labor and are reproached. Why would it be so different? If 
any believing man or woman has widows, if any believing man has widows. Why is it different? Well, he gives you some, and these are not just his guesses. This is based on how many ancient differences there are and what patterns can we see. All of these are codes to different ancient documents. Do you have some on Second Timothy? <laughs> Look at the middle of the screen. He says there aren't any significant variants in time. Now, if somebody said that and seems to be a real scholar, you can quote it. But I'm not significant meaning whether it says Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ. That's unfamiliar. And it goes on to studying that. All right, so you have those. That's an easy way to start looking to see if there's anything you should consider. And I give you also a link for future reference to all that he's listed in the New Testament with an explanation. With his reference and introduction to text. So I think once you pull it up from my PowerPoint, you should, you should make a bookmark to this. That's the question. It will help you without digging into the apparatus at the bottom of the Greek New Testament, which I know no one who is fluent in it. Um, he's done some of the work for it, he said. Enough people have come in on this. He's not being for mentioning the papers. Now, any of you familiar with the Step Bible? I'm only barely familiar with it. But, it had its free some line from Timber House. The way I put this up, mm. all right, you can see here that I'm going to ask it to do the um, Society of Biblical Literature's Greek New Testament with its apparatus and the ESV for First Timothy 1. And there are um, There are choices here to look side by side or interlinear. All right, get right here. This is just your ESV. And see, it says right here that and there are notes to tell you what all these different versions are. And then it's Christu Yesu. And Christu Yesu is the preferred one in this one, too. But this one says that there's also a tradition that says Yesu Christu, and this one says Kyrio, Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's something you can help people say, how do we know the Bible is reliable? Tell them that 99% of the differences are that small. Now, then you come down here, and it gives you um, my true child in faith versus our true child. Also something that's really, you see, when I hovered over that, it gives you all these definitions and stuff. Um, you come down here. Uh, okay, now this one says, I receive mercy that in me, foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience and example of those who believe in him for eternal life. I think that in the long run, it won't happen this way. You'll do yourself a service to at least find the Greek alphabet so that you can look these words out. But other explanations you be available in English. But, you should begin to recognize that Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. But Apason and Pasan, what's the difference in those? If you could look them up, you could see uh, why they're different. Um, whether or not one of those words is included. Well, you keep going through all that, and sometimes you'll run into this is significant. Yeah, it makes it different from how you interpret the passage. I had one other page I wanted to show you what this will do. If I can make it come up right. I was going to put them in the edition more, but anyway. All right. This one is the Society of Biblical Literature's Greek New Testament with apparatus. And here, it puts it all here. This is the verse. This is how you can break it down. Same stuff in a different format. 
this has much, much more available on it. If you were to go up here and want to add something, you can pick a Bible or a commentary. This is Bibles. It's got all those different ones. So if you need to compare versions. The commentaries that it has are not so great. They're all about the commentaries. But some of them you might be able to get something out of. Tischendorf spurious passages that the Great New Testament done. Read that some time. And it says uh, they've got 22 of those. You also have uh, the ancient text if you have the ability to do that. That's the one I was using, the variations apparatus. And it also has ways to learn the Greek alphabet, to know the basics of Greek, and how to use some tools. It's that Bible. Remember, look for it. It's got a lot of stuff in it. And when you go to it, it'll also carry in, mm, I didn't put it on this one. You get to choose up here lots of different things if you want them, if you want the cross references, if you want the footnotes and all that kind of stuff. There is a lot of stuff there that it would take you a lot of time to pull the paper books and, and work with them. And I'm sure it has its faults. I've run into it once before, but. There are some tools you can use here and see if there are, you know, if there's a long section about variants, whether you read Greek or not, you can know, I better find a few commentaries and see if they have anything to say on this. Or, you know, just do a Google search for First Timothy 4 2. And uh, skip over all the ones that are just, you know, Bibles and then find one, see if somebody can tell you what's going on there. So there is research you can do. Also, somehow we'll have to manage this next time. I want to show you the epitome of, of textual variance is Bruce Metzger's textual critical commentary, something like that, that comes with some versions of the United Bible Society's Greek New Testament. There is a copy of it down in the program I want to show you. It's available in things like Logos. It's on our Logos downstairs in the, in the computer lab, and that will be, you know, the ultimate scholarly source to see if, if there's something to look at. And in that one, he does occasionally say, this means that this is a concern, rather than just a long list of which versions and you have no idea which ones are there. So, yeah, exegesis is going to go to the level of do all Bible scholars think this is really a part of it. For example, you know, the one that said there are three that bear witness the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, you look that one out. I'm not saying that's not true. I'm saying that's not part of that passage. So it's just almost certain. So you got to deal with those kinds of things if they relate to your passage. Evidently, if you did apply this, you'd be better off. So you have an idea of where to go with that for Jesus. Let's talk Monday about. How much time you're going to need, I mean, before which I'll probably see how long it should be. And if you can also get a doctrine, what we're done at the same time. You need, you have a, an assignment that I'm thinking to get up on, following the idea of doctrine in the New Testament. And you also um, need to begin thinking what is a doctrine. But make it a fairly broad doctrine that you will want to write why it's an important doctrine to all who will follow Christ. Uh, you will not be able to cover it completely in your paper, but they got And you can guess that I'm thinking, you know, what the millennium means is probably not going to happen. Um, when you do know what the legal standard is for work outside class, don't you? Are you blessed to have someone who has to work with accreditation? The government standards that they hold to the accreditors, who theoretically hold it to the school, is that you spend two hours studying outside of class for every hour you spend in class. If it seems like a lot of work, I'm trying to meet the government standards. <laughs> we had a good discussion earlier. I hope we can more and more have discussions, but I don't want to just wander off and not have it lead to any particular purpose in your, in your program. I'm about to try to turn this thing off.
in here from three you got to get under yeah, uh, well, I, I'm up on the student, yeah. But that's the area. You can go under your. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can just put my gas right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can use that on the library to get a great deal of material that's online. Mm -hmm. The library has specialized.